I've, I've yeah. certainly trained bankers in London, yeah, yeah. you don't just... Um, so, yeah. expert in these matters, and um, I'll pass the form on to him now, and uh, he can give us a little bit of Well, thanks, I do appreciate you coming uh, along today on a Sunday afternoon to listen to me. What's happened there? Oh, there we go. Um, I was asked initially whether I'd talk about the job guarantee, but first of all, um, you've got Bill Mitchell coming along next time to talk to you and having me talk about the job guarantee when you've got Bill Mitchell coming from Newcastle in a sense is uh, people used to say taking coals to Newcastle in England that would be taking coals to Newcastle plus I've already done a talk a couple of talks about job guarantees in in Melbourne and one or two people in the room here have heard um, that already my job is actually talking about uh, money and finance and all that. I'm a lecturer in economics at Adelaide Uni, which I, where I've been now for about 17 years. Um, in the 1990s, uh, and I'm sad to say, even in the late 1980s, um, just because it ages me a bit, uh, I used to train bankers, please don't hate me for this, in London, including from the Bank of England. Um, and that's basically why, or how, when we decided to move to Adelaide, just because I loved Australia and wanted to come and live here. And I love Melbourne, but being a Londoner, spending 35 years in a big city, I wanted to try living in a small town rather than a big city. That's why, <laughs> that's why I live in, in Adelaide. And um, that's how I ended up teaching money and banking courses um, at Adelaide Uni. I've only been a modern monetary theorist partly because of the influence of Bill Mitchell, who, who's coming along to talk to you next time, for oh, somewhere between 10 and 15 years. So if I contrast our way of looking at the world with what is still in Australia anyway, the mainstream way, of looking at the world, the neoclassical way of looking at the world. I'm almost con contrasting the way I see the world now with the way I would have seen it 20 years ago. And if some of the things that I'm going to say, if you're relatively new to MMT, uh, seem at all surprising or confronting, then I like to say that's okay by me. It's great if you're skeptical because um, that was exactly my reaction. I started to get interested in modern monetary theory in about 2004. Um, I wouldn't say that I started describing myself as a modern monetary theorist until just after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which was towards the end of 2008. It took a long while and a lot of uh, reading and research. Some of this story and the description of what modern monetary theory involves and the way we do macroeconomics, something called stock flow consistent macroeconomics, and how it fits in with behavioral economics and work by psychologists, and an attempt to justify and describe how a job guarantee would work and how we think economies ought to be run, is in this book, which is ridiculously overpriced, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, recommend you buying a copy. I, uh, I'm not on a, on a uh, uh, I don't get paid extra money when they <laughs> sell these, but um, if you'd like to take a look at a chapter from the book, the chapter on modern monetary theory for free, then you can send me an email, maybe via the organisers of today's talk, and I'll, I'll send it to you to, to take a look at. And uh, somebody is going to get this copy that I bought with me today anyway. Has anybody heard of Stephanie Kelton? Yes, some of you have. The two most famous uh, modern monetary theorists are Bill Mitchell, who is coming to see you soon, and probably the only one who around the world, amongst the general public anyway, uh, might be more famous than Bill is Stephanie. Stephanie uh, was, came over to uh, Australia last year, um, sponsored by GetUp for the purpose, and she did a talk in Melbourne. Was anyone there? I think it was in the town hall, yeah. 
Uh, she did a talk in Sydney. I went to the one in Sydney. And she did a talk in, in uh, Brisbane. Stephanie is Bernie Sanders' chief economic advisor and was the chief economist on the Democrat side on the Senate Budget Committee a few years ago. She has a great deal of influence, including amongst people who normally only listen to mainstream economists. And it's great that um, the University of Adelaide have made her our visiting Harcourt professor for the next year. She'll be in Adelaide in January. And so many people want to see Stephanie that rather than arranging meetings with her and all of them and flying all over the place, because she's only around for about a week, when she comes over, uh, I'm organising a, a conference um, which will be aimed at politicians and activists and the general public, as well as at economists too, but it's not principally aimed at economists. And uh, Stephanie will be speaking, Warren Mosler, you might also have heard of, who along with Bill invented MMT. He won't be there in person, but he'll be giving a talk as part of the event. We have a whole stream of other speakers in case you feel like coming along. Anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Reserve Bank and the government and the federal debt and all that kind of stuff. But I thought there might be one or two people here who've hardly ever heard of modern monetary theory before or are new to it. So I thought we'd better have a little bit of a refresher. Who's the guy on the left-hand side? Does anyone know? Minsky. That's right. Hyman Minsky. Um, modern monetary theory is built on the shoulders of a previous generation of economists, uh, most important amongst those uh, two people called Abba Lerner and Wynne Godley, and also Hyman Minsky. Most of the American modern monetary theorists were students or colleagues of Minsky. It's popular. <laughs> <laughs> Minsky's become popular since the global financial crisis. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to be aware of how famous Hyman Minsky has become. Every economist has heard of Hyman Minsky now. Uh, in Minsky's most famous book, which was published in 1986, called Stabilising an Unstable Economy, um, he included this quote, the game of policy making is rigged. The prince is constrained by the theory of his intellectuals. I don't believe that the progressive side of politics in Australia, and you could say this in most countries, have ever properly understood how the monetary system works, even in the days when there were fixed exchange rates. It's a different story now. But it's certainly the case now that the Labour Party and the Greens um, and progressives generally around the world um, are fighting often with one arm behind their back because they don't understand the monetary system, because they listen to economists. If you follow Bill's blog, you'll come across a, this a little bit in the context of the Labour Party. <coughs> in the UK, who are themselves from the neoclassical um, mainstream, who present them with options that constrain their choices. They're not aware they have more freedom for good or real than they imagine. And that's why I've include, included this quote from Warren Mosler too. Lack of understanding of the monetary system has been the worst enemy of the pro progressive agenda. Modern money basics. I wrote a couple of years ago an article for the Conversation site where I said that modern monetary theory could be boiled down to two axioms and one identity. An axiom, using that word correctly, is a statement which is obviously true, which you shouldn't even have to justify or test because it's just obviously the case. And I used to um, put the second one before the first one on this list, but I've noticed down through the months that actually it's more effective to reverse them. If you start off by saying a monetary sovereign government, we'll worry what a monetary sovereign government is in a moment, a currency issuing government like ours, faces no purely financial constraints, then you get that emotional reaction from people. They misinterpret what you're saying. They think you're saying that the government should spend without limit. Of course, you're not saying that at all. All economies face real constraints. What do we mean by that? 
Uh, in every society, there's a limited supply of labor and skills and capital equipment and technology and infrastructure and natural resources and ecological space, limiting our productive capacity. And if we spend beyond that productive capacity, then it's going to cause a problem in terms of uh, accelerating inflation. We accept, we accept that. Modern monetary theory does not dismiss the problem of inflation. In fact, in some ways, we think we take it more seriously than mainstream economists do. MMT is not a recipe for limitless spending. It's not even necessarily, in all countries, a recipe for a higher level of public spending than there is at the moment. Well, that first statement is obviously correct. It's an axiom. Well, so is the second one. If you are the monopoly issuer of Australian dollars, you cannot run out of Australian dollars. Um, everybody from Bill Mitchell to Alan Greenspan, the former follower of Ayn Rand and chairman of the Federal Reserve in the US, would agree, as far as that's concerned. So those two statements are obviously correct. The third statement is an identity. That means it's a mathematical equation, which is true by definition. In this case, you can justify it from the national income accounts, or you can justify it just from saying, for every lender in the financial system, there is by definition a borrower. Um, if you need to borrow, if you're spending over this year, let's say, more than you're earning and you're borrowing to cover the difference, then um, an economist might call you a deficit unit. You're running a financial deficit. If I'm spending uh, less than I'm earning and I'm adding to my savings, then I'm a surplus unit. I'm running a financial surplus. Across our entire financial system in Australia, for every surplus unit, there's a deficit unit. For every dollar that is being lent, there's a dollar that's being borrowed. We can aggregate. We can aggregate all households. If we were aggregating all households and I'm a surplus unit and you're a deficit unit, we'd cancel out as far as the aggregate is concerned. We can aggregate across the whole private sector, which includes households and businesses, including financial institutions as well. If we do that so that we've got a, an aggregate balance for the private sector, and there are two other sectors too. There's the government sector and there's the rest of the world. We sometimes call the rest of the world the foreign sector. The same thing applies across those three sectors. They cannot all be running surpluses. If the rest of the world is running a surplus with Australia, which means we have a, uh, what's called a current account deficit on our balance of payments, which we've had since 1974 and we still have at the moment, despite the trade surplus. That means the rest of the world is running a surplus on our financial system. If the government over the next year is also running a surplus on our financial system, what does that mean about the private sector? It means it must be running a deficit. deficit because the surpluses and deficits have to cancel out because for every lender, there is a borrower. This is not a theory, this is just a fact. It would be a theory if you started to try and tell a story about causation, that changes in one balance were driving changes in the others. But in terms of being a statement, it's just an accounting result. It's something that has to be true. Um, what our government is betting on is that our economy will not implode over the next year or two. While the government runs a surplus, it's extremely unlikely that the foreign sector is going to go permanently into deficit in the near future in Australia. So they're betting on the private sector being in deficit. It's extremely unlikely, given the state of our economy, that there's going to be an investment boom as far as businesses are concerned. So they're betting on households going further into deficit. That means they're betting on the ratio of household debt to gross domestic product, which in our country is, is about 125% of GDP at the moment, household debt. They're betting on that rising again. Well, we already have the world's second highest household debt ratio. I don't think that's going to happen. And people like me were saying this a year and a half ago too, when all those mainstream economists, you might have read them, in the newspapers were saying, oh, be careful, interest rates are going to go up in Australia. It's just a matter of time. Interest rates have to rise soon. I could name some financial journalists, but I won't, who were saying that. We were saying, that's not going to happen in the near future. Our economy is going to be quite weak. We have so much household debt at the moment if the government insists on trying to push its budget towards surplus, 
Well, any surplus is going to be very temporary because the economy is going to slow down and potentially go into recession and the tax, tax receipts won't be as strong as they're forecasting. They'll be in the government, will end up with a deficit anyway. Well, all that sort of logic and those um, broadly defined forecasts come basically from understanding the basics of modern monetary theory, which are simple enough to quote uh, uh, another person that we built on, John Maynard Keynes in the general theory. The ideas which are here expressed so laboriously, because actually there's a lot of slides, I won't go through them all with you, otherwise be here all day. Um, they're quite simple. Um, monetary sovereign governments. What is a monetary sovereign government? To be a monetary sovereign government, you have to issue your own currency. Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, they are not monetary sovereign governments. Don't imagine that you can draw any lessons from any of those countries and the way those governments have had to manage their budgets over time and the debt crisis that they've, crisis they've been engaged in. You, you can't draw any lessons from them and apply them to Australia, a completely different case. Monetary sovereign governments issue their own currencies, use a floating exchange rate, so when you're talking about foreign countries that have a fixed exchange rate, well, they've limited their sovereignty by doing that because if you have a fixed exchange rate, you are guaranteeing that you will convert uh, your own currency into foreign currency at a fixed rate to defend the value of your currency while you remain uh, uh, with that fixed rate system in place. And of course, you can run out a foreign currency. So don't compare countries like Argentina or Venezuela, for that matter, with Australia and our monetary system. They have nothing in common with our monetary system. Um, and those countries tend to have significant foreign currency debts too. Our government has no significant foreign currency debt. We have had a floating exchange rate since 1983. And of course, we're a currency issuer. Australia is a monetary sovereign government. The US has a monetary sovereign government, so does the UK, so does Canada, so does Japan, so does New Zealand, so do a stream of other countries that we could list. They are currency issuers and full monetary sovereigns. Everybody else, you and me, um, the small businesses near where you live, BHP, the state government of Victoria, the government of Greece, they're all currency users. Well, if you're a currency user, if you're going to spend, you've got to earn the money before you can spend, or else you have to run down past savings to pay for your spending, or else you have to borrow before you can spend. And when I talk about the net money supply, I'm talking about the total indebtedness of our federal government, basically. So, how are you going to fund your surplus? That's the issue. Deficits are self-financing. What do I mean by that? Every time the government spends, they create dollars. When they tax, they destroy dollars. If they spend more than they tax, the number of dollars goes up. That's what happens. It's self-financing. Those dollars, as I'm going to tell you about before we finish, if I don't spend too long talking about this kind of stuff, for reasons to do with interest rate management, are converted into treasury bonds. In other words, the Australian Office of Financial Management, the Treasury basically regularly auctions treasury bonds to absorb those dollars that have been created by this government net spending because it helps the RBA to manage interest rates. That's why they do it. Not because they need the dollars. Why would they need the dollars? They create the dollars. On the other hand, federal surpluses don't pay for themselves. When people talk about the problem of funding the federal deficit, they've got it 180 degrees the wrong way around. The problem is in funding surpluses. Surpluses tend to drive economies into recession. Paul Keating managed to have a surplus just before the big recession in the early 1990s. Of course, John Howard had a surplus. We didn't have a recession. What they managed to do was deregulate the financial system, lend, 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 lend to households and treble the amount of household debt. We've not dealt with that problem yet. Yeah? It's, a, it's, a, it's a hanging around the neck of the economy and dragging it backwards at the moment. Um, federal surpluses must be funded either by the rest of the world deficit spending. If you're Germany and you're running a, a huge 
current account surplus. If you're a Singapore or Norway running a huge current account surplus, sure, then you can have your government running a surplus and your private sector running a surplus because it's the rest of the world that's borrowing on your financial system. That's what's happening as far as you're concerned. That's not the case for Australia. Here are Australia's financial balances as a percentage of our GDP, direct from the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, since the late 1980s. Now, that line across the top, that's the foreign sector balance. If you changed it from a plus to a minus, it would be our current account deficit. It's been between about 2% of GDP and about 7% of GDP ever since 1974. It's about 2% now because our trade surplus is, is quite strong. The current account includes payments of uh, interest, profits, dividends, and one or two other things too. And, and basically, Australia's current account is not in surplus even now. It's been reasonably stable over time. If you're worried about the country having a big deficit with the rest of the world, as you, I suppose you might be, although with a floating exchange rate, it's not exactly a problem. Um, that happened when John Howard was Prime Minister. That happened when there was a federal surplus. If people tell you a federal deficit necessarily means a bigger current account deficit, not in Australia, not, not in the last 40 years anyway. Quite the opposite, if anything. What you can see here, well, let's get rid of the rest of the world. We'll just have the government balance and the private balance. You see, when the rest of the world was there, the three of them, on average, would come out to zero. That was the point of including all three balances. Since the foreign balance has been a plus the whole time, if we just look at our um, federal government balance and private sector balance, well, you can see this is what economists would describe pretty clearly, not just economists, anybody that had done first year statistics. There's something of a negative correlation there going back over recent decades, isn't there? Um, when, there's, when everybody gets really pessimistic because there's a global financial crisis, even if Australia doesn't have a nasty recession, then the private sector rapidly goes from being in huge deficit to surplus because everybody wants to save and nobody wants to borrow anymore and the banks don't want to lend anyway. Um, of course, the government balance goes into deficit. About half of that was Kevin Rudd deliberately running a deficit to support the economy. The other half was our automatic fiscal stabilisers, just tax receipts crashing because the economy stopped growing um, at the time. What's the point of this graph? The point of this graph is this is what they're forecasting at the moment. Not just the government, but in the recent election, the opposition too. In fact, they were promising to do it even more. When Chris Bowen was the shadow treasurer before the election, he was saying, yes, we're going to run a, uh, a surplus, we're going to pay down the debt. He should have said, we're going to destroy some money. That's what it means. But he didn't say that because he didn't understand. It's not his fault, it's his advisors. But anyway, um, they talked about running a bigger surplus than the coalition was promising to run, and that's what the coalition is promising. They're promising to push us above that line. What that means is they're promising to push the private sector further into deficit. I don't think we're going to have a business investment boom. I don't think it's businesses that will be doing the deficit spending if this happens. They'll need to find some way of getting the private sector to deficit spend and not businesses, and that means households. So how will we fund their fiscal surplus? You're going to have to borrow more to make it happen, otherwise it won't happen. I don't think it will happen for very long. But what happened last time we did this? Well, this is what happened last time we did this. The Howard Costello government managed to run years of budget surpluses and part of that was the mining companies borrowing a lot to dig big holes in the ground. That investment boom's finished now. But much of it was households borrowing huge amounts and, and that's one of the reasons why it's so expensive to buy any housing in places like Sydney and Melbourne and why the property market in those two big cities, this city, is so dicey. These days, it's that enormous build-up in household debt. Only Switzerland is above us. Only Switzerland is above us as far as household debt is concerned. So what they're gambling on at the moment is that somehow they can get that red line going up again. What people like me and Steve Keen and 
other people who know much more about these things than I do, are saying is we, we just don't believe that will happen. So we don't think the economy is going to grow very quickly. And in fact, there are signs of it not happening already. The amount of new lending has been decelerating over the last year, just as the property bubble has. It's not burst or anything, but it's deflated somewhat for the last year and a half. We don't think it's going to happen. So I think, well, you know, they might get one year of surplus, but it's quite likely we're going to get a recession in Australia in the next year or two, unless they change their tune. All right.